We are always thinking about leadership at the end of a long journey, right? Being a CEO. Yeah. But there is leadership at every stage of um, our career. What is it that a senior leader needs to remind self on day to day basis? Are we being good ancestors? Since the beginning of 2020, Raju Narasetti has been leading McKinsey and Company's global publishing operations. Our tendency is to want to be clever all the time. But it's a lot harder to be kind. Leadership modesty is about knowing the limits of what you know and what you don't know. And it's about asking questions and be willing to hear true answers. Look, I think the best leaders tend to actually question success. Thank you so much, Raju. Such a pleasure having you here. Oh, thank you for having me. And um, you have some amazing guests and I'm honored to be considered as somebody who could add value to your audience. Thank you. You know, I'll be very truthful, in fact, and that's what I was talking to you, that when I connected with you, I thought that I should have somebody senior from McKinsey to talk about the challenges a C-suite executive faces. Uh, what are the important imperatives that a C-suite executive should have? And I connected with you. And when I started digging deeper into your profile, the kind of work that you have done, your career graph, I must tell you, it's not only impressive, the right word is it's very inspiring. Very, very inspiring. Thank you for being who you are, Raju. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I just want to make it clear that... Um... Uh, you know, I'm by no means a senior person at McKinsey. I've only been here for about four years. And I also am not on the client facing side, which is where you would expect a lot of conversations about uh, how to help CEOs and all that um, happen as well. I'm happy to talk about publishing and what McKinsey does um, in terms of bringing those ideas from our senior partners and others to the world. Um, so delighted to have this opportunity. Thank you. Just curious, right? The era that you belong to, you've got over 30 years of experience. A very polite way of saying I'm old, but yes. No, I'm coming, wait. <laughs> I'm saying you've got over three decades of experience, right? In that era, people would have given a thought that they should get into either being an MBBS doctor or an engineer or at the maths lawyer. What inspired you to pursue a career in business journalism? Yeah, I wish I could say that that was um, a goal to begin with. Um, I I grew up in Hyderabad, um, a very lower middle income family where the value of education as a way to get ahead was instilled in me. I uh, wasn't very good at either math or science, uh, but I had the fortune of um, having parents who didn't care about uh, that as yeah. much as many Indian parents do. And this was, I'm talking in the, I was born in 66. So I'm talking in the 70s and 80s. Um, and um, in a way, looking back in hindsight, perhaps I was also doomed by DNA. My mom was a professor of English literature and my dad was, um, he had a PhD in philosophy, but also was a journalist. So perhaps yeah. you know, I, I was going to be stuck in journalism. I just didn't know that. I actually, I did a BA in economics from Nizam College, uh, Hyderabad, the Usmani University. Uh, mm -hmm. Did an MBA from the Institute of Rural Management, Irma in Anand. I actually worked for about a year, year and a half as a sales manager for a big dairy products company, um, mm -hmm. selling cheese and butter. Um, and then at some point realized that uh, I that's not how I want to spend the rest of my life, you know, measuring my success in the amount of lorries of cheese and ghee and butter that I sold, uh, mm. which was what the what the profession was at that time. Uh, then I actually thought about, you know, what do I like doing? And I realized that uh, growing up, you know, I used to dash off letters to the editor mm -hmm. of newspapers, uh, Deccan Chronicle and Indian Express in Hyderabad. Um, and then I liked kind of um, writing uh, in a way. I wasn't great at it, but I enjoyed doing that. More than that, I've always felt like um, I'm a very curious person. I always kept asking the why of something. And mm. that's the fundamental quality that journalism needs, whether you like it or not, right? The ability to kind of look at something and say, let why, or like try to explain mm. that to yourself and then 
hopefully to a larger audience. So then I ended up like um, applying to a, a journalism school in Delhi that was run by the Times of India School of Journalism at that time, um, mm-hmm. and then did a year's uh, postgraduate diploma, and then ended up working for the Economic Times, and that's how my career in journalism began. I did feel like I needed to study journalism, you know, the, the ethics of journalism and things like that a bit more rigorously applied to a bunch of schools in the U.S., um, got in um, and ended up uh, for my master's at Indiana University in Bloomington. And that's how, um, and then have spent the next 30 years in the U.S. Uh, on, on and off. Uh, so um, it was not a destination that I started off heading to, but uh, ended up being a great ride. I'm sure. Not only great, it's actually very, very inspiring, Raju. You know, Raju, you spoke about ethics. And I personally believe that media, journalism, they are responsible for creating a larger context where economy, where businesses can thrive. Now, just wondering at the same time, media can also make or break organizations, image and impact general public sentiment. So as a journalist, how do you decide that which part you would like to reveal and which part you would like to conceal? Yeah, I don't know if reveal and conceal are the right frames for what journalists do, right? Mm -hmm. You begin by, um, you know, like I said, you begin by asking questions about things that you see and things that you hear or explanations Mm -hmm. that you get, uh, especially from companies. um, And uh, try to make sure that the dots are connected and it adds up. And if it doesn't, then you do more probing into it. But it begins and ends with really putting yourself in the shoes of um, a, a, your audience, right? You're basically, your job is to be a conduit of explanation, of clarity, of probing. So I think what you try to do mostly is to look at something and try to explain it to a larger audience. And in doing so, sometimes you unearth things. Uh, my, mm-hmm. you know, most favorite stories at the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere have been the so-called investigative stories where you write about companies that are saying one thing and doing another thing. Mm. Um, and it is lo- it not about like saying, I know 10 things and I'm going to somehow keep a couple of things. But you have mm. to always balance how you say what you say by being fair, right? You can't mm. like be unfair. You can't selectively use some things uh, to you know, frame an organization or a CEO in a particular way, um, and if you do that, then everything you do can be revelatory without being uh, necessarily the intent of damaging something. Right? Mm-hmm. Facts are at the end of the day facts. Um, the, I think that your question is coming, especially in the Indian context, from a couple of things. Right? One is that I mm-hmm. think there is a there is a very low level of trust in journalism in India. Uh, Absolutely. Time, I think people have felt like it can be bought and sold. Unfortunately, media companies actually, um, you know, sell access, uh, yeah. which is uh, which is unfortunate. There's not a lot of regulation, either self mm-hmm. or otherwise. Uh, and I think that has caused trust to erode um, in many ways. And as a result, then media can be manipulated uh, for a good and bad um, output, right? Um, mm. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I launched a paper in India called Mint um, many, many years ago. It's still one of India's uh, well-known Change business papers. Um, I was interviewing somebody who was already a journalist at another business publication. And I was saying, why is it that journalism in India is so one-sided? And I was mm. pointing to a story where... Um, this person actually had done a story saying, uh, I think it was Coke or Pepsi, I forget now. One of them was mm-hmm. launching something and he quoted the person from that company as saying, we are going to destroy, you know, and we're going to win all the share. We're going to like be number one. And that story did not have any comment from the other company. Mm-hmm. So I asked this reporter saying that, you know, why is it this way? And he says, you know, actually nothing wrong with it. Today I write about what he said and tomorrow I talk to the other company and do a second story about 
they respond. So I get two stories out of every story, right? Mm -hmm. Which seems like a very strange way of like thinking about it because there's no balance. There's no, and the assumption is that your, your um, readers are going to read both stories on both days, which is a fair yeah. assumption, right? So I think yeah. a lot of practices are also um, causing the lack of trust. Uh, some of it is self-inflicted uh, as well. Um, and also I think people, one of the nice things about journalism, particularly in the West, is still that there are layers of eyes. You know, there are editors and there are editors and there's a copy desk and there's a whole set of people. So as a result, like even if you accidentally say something that feels biased or that feels incomplete, somebody else will catch it right along the process. And hopefully the outcome is that a more complete, uh, a well-rounded article is what you put in front of your readers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, for, in, in fact, I had this question in my mind that I wanted to ask you because I heard you saying this, that we are not in the business of just giving insights or informing the public. We are in the business of helping people solve a problem. And now when I just heard you saying that, it should not be biased towards one organization or towards one party. I can actually relate to what you're talking about. And I could actually connect the dot when you're talking about ethics. And as I was just listening to you, I actually went deeper within my own set, the assumption that I was operating from. And you are correct that it's coming from the worldview that I have, that I'm sitting in India. And I look at how media is on day-to-day -day basis. It's creating a context which could be damaging for the other party. I was saying that we all stand where we sit, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, our context is where we are, and so that's mm -hmm. and that's fine to that's fine to have. Um, I do want to make one distinction between what I do now at McKinsey, and that's the context of um, you know focusing on impact and not just insights. Mm -hmm. We are not really in the business of news, right? I mean, if you read what McKinsey Publishing does, we are far mm -hmm. from news um, because that's not our role. We are not publishing uh, for that reason. But at the same time, um, I think having great uh, insights um, is very critical, but it's also become table stakes. By that, I mean that, and we think we are very good at what we uh, do at McKinsey, and we think our knowledge and our insights are, you know, state of the art or, you know, really better than easy for me to say, better than um, most others. Mm. But it's only good if it makes sense for somebody who's reading it, in our case, a business, global business audience, mm. that they're seeing the ability to apply that to their problem. So that's what I mean by saying that all of our publishing mm. you know, beliefs in this journey that we are taking our readers, our audiences, um, from insights to impact. And the impact comes from a banking CEO reading an article from McKinsey about, mm. let's say, um, the use of digitization in thinking about banking and how its services can reach audiences without having to do brick or mortar, right? Mm. The article comes from a lot of our senior colleagues, you know, usually partners and senior partners, having spent a lot of time with a set of different banks around the world, drawing mm -hmm. some lessons and putting it out there. And so if the CEO is reading it, he or she, she should be able to say, some of this is actually applicable to the problem I'm currently facing, mm -hmm. maybe not all. And it's giving me new ways of thinking about this problem that I'm dealing with. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to pick up the phone and call McKinsey, by the way, to come and help them. Yeah. If it helps them think about a problem in a different way, I think that's great for McKinsey because we have given them that insight. But oftentimes people actually do pick up the phone and call McKinsey and say, look, I've read this and uh, it seems applicable to my issues. I have slightly different issues, but can you come and talk to us? Right? Yeah. So that's the reason McKinsey is, is in publishing and that's the reason we believe in this insights to impact journey. Um, mm -hmm. Look, well before BuzzFeed News came and went, McKinsey <laughs> was famous for his lists yeah. of right five things, seven things, ten things. Um, mm -hmm. So if you read most of our articles, there's actually takeaways all the time. Mm -hmm. There's like we distill like a 1,500, 2,500 word article. And even within the article, there'll be usually three, four, five things that you can apply to your situation. 
we are not very prescriptive. We often tend to kind of provide scenarios because we are not in a position to know what your problem is, right? If you are a media company and you're doing podcasts, you may have um, a, a issue with like how to scale technology. You may have an issue with how to increase reach. You may be thinking about, do I need to do something in different languages, right? So when we write about here are some smart ways for a media company to think about audio, we don't know what your exact problem is. But if we can talk about here are half a dozen things that we've learned on how media companies are using audio to attract audiences, it's possible that mm. we may find two or three things applicable to your current situation. So that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Some combination would always be useful. In fact, that's what I find it very interesting every time when I go through different articles from McKinsey. That brings me to another question. You know, when you moved away from the media world and gotten into the publishing and taking care of McKinsey, what shifts did you have to go through with them? What did you retain and what did you let go? Yeah, so just to again put it in context, um, about for the last 35 years that I've been in the space of media and information and content, the first 25 years or so, I was committing personal acts of journalism myself, you know, editing, writing, all of that. But um, before coming to McKinsey, I had all I had already moved into the intersection of media, business, technology, strategy, um, and was a CEO and a publisher. I think the big difference is that I left the news business when I joined McKinsey um, to come into what's called you know, the B2B uh, space, and that was new. Um, the reason I thought it was an interesting uh, role was something that I have, a principle that I have followed um, in a lot of my decisions about what I do next, which is answer this question for myself, which is, when is the last time I did something for the first time? Meaning that I know I have accumulated a lot of interesting skills, but at the same time, if something comes up where it feels like it's not something I've done before, then it becomes a two-way street, right? Because I bring a lot to the table, but I'm also then learning a lot. I've never done B2B publishing. So as a result, I felt like, yes, I can help in many ways because there were some interesting uh, challenges to overcome. Um, and at the same time, I felt like, I would also have a pretty steep learning curve. And those are the best jobs, right? Because if you go into a job thinking, you know, there is, you know, everything there is to do about this job. Sure, I think you will do fine, but I'm not sure how fulfilling that will be. Look, I mean, leadership modesty is not necessarily about being humble, right? And I'm not being humble. I knew I could do a lot. I bring a lot to the McKinsey publishing role. But leadership modesty is about knowing the limits of what you know and what you don't know. And it's about asking questions and be willing to hear true answers. So it felt like I could come in, um, had a lot of hypothesis. I didn't have a lot of answers simply because I needed to make sure that I understand what was happening once you come in. Uh, but I also knew that I was going to learn a lot. So it's been a fun um, four years now um, where most of um, what we have done is to create meaningful differences, not better sameness. Meaning, sure, I could do something better and the same thing, but the goal has been to create meaningful differences because end of the day, my audience, busy business executives around the world, are really pressed for time. So the only thing I'm really competing for is your time. And the only way I can do it is A, by respecting your time, which means that you know distilling something we are publishing and also giving you you know list of things to apply to yourself, but also kind of being you useful, informative, but providing an experience when you consume a McKinsey insight, where mm. it is interactive, where there's interesting data, where it's presented um, in multimedia, all the while respecting your time. Because if I can get 10 more minutes of your time, of your very busy day, then the battle is won, right? Because then I yeah. can, can like engage you, I can do make you do more things with me. Oh, Not I'm sure. And I just love the choice of the words that you have used, especially when you said creating an experience 
and engaging your audience. And now I can connect the dots because you know I was just asking myself, given a choice to me to look for an article, why do I go to McKinsey Publishing? And I'm just asking myself. And the images which are coming in front of me is the way you represent data. So the data visualization is, I think, it's by far one of the best in the world. The choice of the videos, the animations, the audio, and of course the written material. If I put everything together, I think that that itself is a very different layer, which is not available with other publishing houses. Just wondering, Raju, in your experience, when you dwell deeper into the business context and the business world, you pulled yourself out of the media world. So that means there's a very different lens through which you started to look at the world. You started interacting with business leaders, thought leaders. What were some of those common myths that you were holding that got challenged? Or, and what do you think are the common myths that people have about the business world that got challenged and questioned? Yeah, especially when you um, grow up in journalism, there is this notion of church and state where the content creation and the news side is very separate from the business side in a news organization. And that was, it's been there for a long time. It's considered very healthy. Over time, it also became, instead of church and state, it became church versus state. There was a level of animosity because I think the newsroom people thought the business side will sell their soul for an extra dollar. And the business side felt like the newsroom didn't understand what it takes to actually monetize and support the newsroom. So when you grow up uh, in that environment, you have certain preconceived notions. I had the luxury of, as I said before, I had the luxury of doing an MBA, of being very comfortable with, you know, P&L and, you know, balance sheets and kind of feeling that business has a very significant role to play. Um, I've always been a capitalist at heart, so I never thought of business as bad. Um, business as it is run can be bad if you don't pay attention to society that in which business operates. But inherently, I think it creates a lot of value. So I came into it with, um, I think, a more educational, theoretical understanding of the value of business. So I was not as skeptical as many journalists um, tend to be. I think what you, what you unlearn are that unless you spend time with people, um, you don't realize that they are equally interested in the brand, the value of your content. Because if you're in advertising, if if people don't trust the brand, it's much harder for you as, an, as a salesperson, right? So you are equally interested in making sure that the newsroom and the value of the newsroom and the trust is there. So you're not trying to do anything to destroy that. Sure, you may make money in the short term, but in the long term, it'll be very hard. So the, the really good business side people understood the value of trust and church and state and making sure that you're putting out useful, interesting, but also uh, trustworthy content. So I think this realization that at either end of this, there are people who are committed to doing the right thing is a bit of a uh, real realization that you get. And the second piece is that, as I said, I think, unfortunately, in the media industry, uh, church and state has become church versus state, where there is a real unwillingness to understand the value of business in supporting journalism. And I think this is a sad outcome of um, what is a good practice of like separating these two. So I have deliberately um, kind of embraced a strategy of really stay, putting myself at intersections mm. because those mm. are the hardest roles to do. Um, the intersection of news and advertising or the intersection of news and audience and analytics or technology or strategy or product. Mm. Um, because I think that's where the content industry fails or succeeds. Mm. And you can't do it at either ends. So you have to really do it at the intersection. And it's still a challenge. So that's been a 
you know, over time, a realization, and I'm now a big advocate for um, this idea that it cannot be church versus state. It has to be church and state. Mm. Um, and yeah. so when you come into an organization, you take your time studying what it needs to be done. But then you move, um, you know, you know, you move pretty quickly. And I think on the journalism side, uh, there is li like a level of comfort that um, comes from uh, inertia. But I think on the business side, you do want to kind of make your decisions very quickly. There's a there's a famous congressman, uh, you know, a legendary congressman in uh, the U.S. called John Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, and um, his famous uh, quote is, when you pray, move your feet. And I, you know, I think that I've embraced that to say when you think, move your feet, as in like, you know, um, drive transformation, then be caught up in transformation. Precisely. Precisely. You know, yesterday only I was having this conversation with a, another leader and we were thinking that what should we be focusing on? The time that we are spending on reflection or the mm -hmm. time that we are investing in action. Two different philosophies. But the word that I'm just picking up right now is intersection. When you use the word intersection between the church and the state. You also use the word capitalism. Just curious, Raju. In this world, and we all have witnessed businesses which are only focused towards taking care of top and the bottom line without taking care of, I, I'm not going to use the word consciousness, however, in the same space, making sure that the organization contributes to the society as well making sure that it takes care of the resources available in the world as well. What are your views on this? Yeah, I think over time, that philosophy of like, just worry about like revenues and profits um, hasn't served um, humanity well, right? Hasn't served mm. business well, hasn't served CEOs well, hasn't served societies well. And mm. I'm glad to see that I think that philosophy has dramatically evolved over time. We could still argue mm -hmm. that um, companies or organizations should do more than they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it will always be a work in progress. But there's not an organization or a CEO who's not thinking in these terms, right? I mean, take McKinsey, for example. Uh, our, our history and our ethos is that we, are, we care about our customers, right? Because And then we care about our employees. And that that was like the the ambition. But over time, I think there's also been a strong realization that you also have to care about the society in which you operate, right? And as a result, things like, um, you know, we are leaders in um, sustainability. We are leaders in like wanting to talk about climate change. Um, our work in DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion is like bar none, I think, in terms of the consulting uh, world. We spend billions in our global social responsibility, both at a local level and at a, at a larger level. Um, I think part of being a leader, whether you're leading, um, you know, the publishing piece of McKinsey or whether it's our global managing partner or any leader, right? It is, um, it is to be able to answer a question that um, the scientist uh, Jonas Salk um, actually uh, asked us to ask ourselves, which is, are we being good ancestors? Meaning, by the time we become ancestors, would we be considered good? Which means what a that, beautiful question. Are we exactly, right? I mean, it's so profound and it's so simple. Mm -hmm. And that, applies, by the way, it sounds very profound, but it applies to very practical things. In my case, um, in almost every single job that I've had and left, Post my leaving, there's always been the ability for that organization to replace me with somebody internal, right? Which means mm -hmm. that I spend a lot of energy on succession planning, not because I'm heading out of the door, all right, but you owe it to the organization for however long you're there that you've created a cadre of people who can replace you. So that's what I mean by saying each of us as leaders has to answer this question Am I being a good ancestor? What a profound question.
what kind of ancestor am I going to be? You know, it also means it's not about leaving the legacy. It's about living the legacy. Mm -hmm. Very often I've come across leaders who find it extremely difficult to invest on succession planning because of their own fears, because of their own insecurities. How did you manage to get over that? That's one. Or was there a very different context that you were operating from that helped you to have this smooth transition? Yeah, listen, I mean, every job I've taken, including this job, I've often thought I'm going to be a disaster at it, right? And that's not a bad feeling to have that you may fail at something, right? That means that you're not going in with hubris and that you will, you know, you shouldn't fear failure, but you should have that element of like, maybe, you know, this is the first time I'm doing this. Maybe I'll be a disaster at it. Uh, four years in, I think I'm not as much of a disaster as I thought I might be. Um, it varies by individual to individual, right? Which is in my case, over time, I've not seen my career as a ladder that you need to keep climbing because when you think of ladders uh, and, and a career, um, the only way you can move forward is if somebody in front of you in the ladder falls off or you, you, or you get on their shoulders and jump above them, right? I have over time really thought of um, my career as a bit of a you know seesaw. You know, most of us, when we were young, um, remember going to playgrounds, and you know there will be slides and there'll be there'll be swings, there'll be a seesaw in a typical playground. The seesaw is one place, first of all, where you need somebody else to succeed because you can't do it by yourself. Somebody else has to sit on the other side, and if you Think back, you actually do it for about, I don't know, five minutes. You go up, up and down. And then at some point, you get off and let somebody else kind of take it over. And you go to some do something else. So I've always thought of like my career is like a bit of a seesaw where I go up. You know, um, you, have, you, have, you, you have fun, but it's the other person is also kind of rising with you. And that's what gets into the succession issue. And at some point, you walk away and go do the next thing. Let somebody else uh, take your side of the seesaw. Um, so if you start thinking about that, a career as an accumulation of experiences rather than just a straight linear path up, then it becomes easy to not to worry about things like succession. McKinsey Publishing, if something happens to me today, uh, my deputy, um, which, um, she's the global editorial director, and um, Lucia Rahili can totally do my job. And it's a matter of pride for me that she can do my job rather than fearing. I think the biggest challenge with um, being a leader is how do you balance between being a microscope and a telescope yeah. and make sure you're not over-indexing to either micromanaging or being absent, right? And if you can figure out that balance, then, you know, the job is mostly well done. You know, I, I hear you, Raju. The beautiful example of the seesaw and, of course, the analogy of being a microscope and or a telescope. I'm, I hear you. I see you. I know exactly what you are saying. And yet, there are less leaders than there are leadership books in the world. People struggle to identify five leaders in their organization that they look up to. What do you think, having you have worked with so many C-suite executives, you have interviewed so many leaders, you have been instrumental in making sure that the organization publishes few books. In fact, in the recent past, the organization has published a book on the six mindset of the CEO. What do you think are the primary mindsets that distinguishes a top performing CEO from the mediocre ones? Look, as you said, um, CEO excellence, which is there actually, a bestseller. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, several of my colleagues who actually spend all their life 
being CEO, counselors have written it and it's got some amazing experiences and it lists a whole uh, set of uh, behaviors and practices that separate like good CEOs from uh, great CEOs, right? So what I can do is to just talk about my own uh, personal experiences and um, views about it. I think the first thing is like, look, leading and managing people is a privilege. Uh, I mean, being a good manager is actually really, really difficult, right? Who wants to have those tough conversations? So you have to approach it as a real privilege and that your job is not managing tasks and all of that, that come that come with the job, but really it's about helping uh, people who work with you to manage it. Mm-hmm. Two, I think you have to have a sense that innovation is a group endeavor, right? And the way I think about it is that, look, I'm not being facetious, but when I, at McKinsey, when I walk into a room, I, uh, I increase the average age and I drop the average IQ. And I'm pretty happy about that, meaning that I'm one of the older people. I work with a lot of very young people and almost all of them is way smarter than I am at what they do. So you can't be the smartest person in the room. If you think you are, actually it's time to change the room, right? So if you bring those kind of attitudes to um, leadership, right? Which is that this group helps you develop your strengths, manage your weaknesses. Um, I think it works. Look, in the long term, you have to be much more concerned about your character than your reputation. I mean, character is who I am. Reputation is what others think I am, right? One can be altered. Yeah, the other one is our true self. So I think if you if you have that attitude, uh, and finally, I look, I think people become less effective leaders when they go into a role and think of that role as a terminal job. Precisely. The, the moment you start thinking, this is it for me, I'm going to do this for, you know, I'm going to retire from here. I think then you can take decisions and that are more self-preserving than what's and right. Precisely. You're trying to protect something there. More fearful. So I think I've always gone into roles as saying that, look, as long as I'm providing value um, and it's interesting and you feel like you're also growing, then this is the role. Um, and so I think lots of things go into being a good leader um, mm-hmm. There isn't really one thing. A lot of times when we ask this question, we're always thinking about leadership at the end of a long journey, right? Being a CEO. Yeah. But there is leadership at every stage of um, our career, right? When, you, when you're an individual contributor, when you just begin, when you own things, when you execute things, um, I think there is leadership. Look, there was this, um, you're, you're probably too young, but when I was growing up, there was this amazing West Indian cricketer called Alvin Kalicharam. Um, he was like, uh, he was a legendary cricketer. He said mm. something later in life, much later in life, that has really uh, stuck with me. And it's a it's a bit of a long kind of a quote. It goes um, something like this. Make simple things a habit. And when you make simple, simple things a habit, it creates a consistency. When you create consistency, you create discipline. And when you create discipline, you create concentration, and then you simplify the game. And that's when you win every single day. So I think being a good leader is try, kind of make sure that you make simple things a habit, you create consistency, um, you create a bit of a discipline around it, you concentrate on what you need to do. And then the game gets pretty simple, by the way. Hmm. And the one thing that Kali Charan didn't say, which I, I would add to it, is that you've got to over-communicate. You've got to be transparent. People have to know where you come from. And that's the only way to build trust, right? Um, yeah. It, look, I, it's easy to say this in abstract. That there are times when I've struggled to be any of this. But I think if you... Um, if you are um, short term impatient with tasks Mm. and long-term patient with results, 
you'll do fine. Mm. You know, the last five to seven minutes, I think that for me, that was a masterclass. That was pure gold. Thank you. So when you spoke about leading and managing others is a privilege. I so believe in that because, you know, the very fact that you are giving me this time, it's my sheer honor that in your lifetime, you have given me those 50 minutes. If this is not privileged, if this is not an honor, what else? What else would be that somebody is willing to give you his or her time? And then you spoke about the innovation is a group endeavor. Loved it. Loved it. I never looked at innovation from that perspective. However, on the high side, if I look at all the great innovations, all the um, creative tasks, all the new thinking came to me as a part of the brainstorming with my team. Mm -hmm. And then you spoke about if you're the smartest people in the room, it's the wrong room. Character versus reputation. And don't get stuck with your role. Don't consider that as a terminal role. Double click on character versus reputation. A few days back, I had the privilege of interviewing Shanta Rajuji. Shanta Raju was the CEO of Indus Towers. Mm -hmm. During my conversation, he mentioned something so profound. He said, people don't respect you for your designation. They respect you for your humility. You also mentioned character or reputation. In the world where we celebrate reputation, how can someone start to emphasize more on character when the outside world people are celebrating the designation CEO, CXO, Vice President, Director. It's a very slippery road. Very, very slippery road. What is it that a senior leader needs to remind self on a day-to-day -day basis? Just one thing, honestly. Uh, and I say this all the time to um, people, especially young uh, people, which is it's a lot harder to be kind than clever. Right, we our tendency is to want to be clever all the time, but it's a lot mm. harder to be kind. And I think if you practice um, kindness um, and combine that with cleverness, you 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 get to be a CEO or a CXO or a CTO because you're smart and you've done some good things, and people have recognized that. But mm. what got you there isn't necessarily what's going to make you successful. Because what got you there is individual performance oftentimes. What's going mm. to make you successful as a leader is when you define yourself in how well people un with you, under you, around you have done. Look, in journalism, um, it's when people leave your organization, you take it very personally um, because you, you know, you first of all, you like them. But over time, mm. I've also realized that, you know, good leadership is not worrying about that people have moved on from you. But in seeing what they have done after, you know you're no longer their leader, right? Mm -hmm. Because hopefully, if you have done your job well, they've all gone on to do some interesting things. Part of the greatest joy I have in um, being the founder of Mint newspaper in India is so many of the the original founding team members have gone on in India and outside to do amazing things, and I hope that my time with them. And the time they were part of the founding team has instilled certain values, certain discipline, certain consistency, and that they're practicing that. And hopefully, somewhere along the way, given a chance, they're saying, you know what, the, the time I had at Mint uh, was stressful, um, uh, but also that um, I've learned some things and they've stayed with me all my life. That's the only way to measure success, right? And I've not been involved in with Mint for like over a decade now, um, but when I think about, you know, Mint is like my, I have two girls as daughters. I think of Mint as my third child, um, but very similar to my daughters who are in college, going off to college. I see Mint as growing up and doing its own thing and becoming an adult. But the satisfaction I get when uh, I see somebody who was with me at Mint, who has gone on to do other things is way more joyful than kind of thinking, oh, everybody has moved on from Mint. Yeah. Thank you. What a profound thought.
And I think I only wish that we can have more leaders who believe in this, who genuinely believe in this. As you mentioned, that you feel really great when you see that people who are a part of your team, they are doing exceptionally well, not only in India, but globally as well. Just one last question, Raju. You know, in today's world, people are talking about thought leadership. People are talking about executive presence. Considering character as the basic foundation, what do you think, what are those great CEOs are doing to further strengthen their thought leadership and executive presence, which is helping them, helping them to enhance their influence in the business world? Look, I think the best leaders tend to um, actually question success more than the question failure. Because I think you want to kind of say what has worked and, you know, why has it worked rather than spend a lot of time on things that have failed because, look, I mean, experiments are called experiments because they fail. Um, and if you don't do enough experiments, then chances are that you'll fail more often than you will succeed. So the best leaders tend to kind of, I think, draw lessons from questioning success than worrying about question failure. Two, I think, uh, the ability to listen um, is pretty critical um, and create enough structure where you're not caught up in the echo chamber of being a CEO and only being told what they think you would like to know is pretty important. And that requires um, people to be able to have enough trust in you, uh, enough access to you uh, and see you as like, you know, somebody who... Um, is willing to both listen and hear. In my case, I have a lot of hypotheses all the time. I don't have a lot of answers. Because if you begin by thinking you have answers, uh, pretty good chance that um, you get many things wrong because you're then fixated on what you think is your way to do things. But if you think in terms of hypothesis saying, um, Maybe this is a way to do something and then test that hypothesis against the facts and against with your team, with external um, uh, help. Uh, you probably will be a better leader. Thank you. I just love it when you said it's time to say goodbye to the core chamber of a CEO. Come back home, start questioning your success, start listening and have more hypotheses rather than having more answers. You know, if there's one thing that you know for sure with 100% certainty and surety, what would that be? It would be simply that um, I don't know a lot of things. I feel like every day it's a discovery and you learn new things. And um, that's what makes, uh, you know, a role um, particularly joyful. Look forward to having you again to talk more about challenges, opportunities, and what's new happening in the world of thought leadership and McKinsey. Um, thank you. Uh, we, we don't like to think of it as thought leadership, even though we invented it, because anybody can have thoughts. Uh, anybody can think of themselves as a leader. But um, we hope that what we put out helps people solve their problems. Um, so that's why the whole insights to impact uh, philosophy at uh, McKinsey. Listen, and thank you. I really appreciate you making the time for this. And um, we hopefully we'll talk soon. Raju, thank you so much. I can go on for hours and hours together. I know I will not get tired asking more questions and extracting wisdom from you. And I'm just taking notes. So thank you so much for being who you are, being so generous with your responses, sharing experiences,